wanted to first of all apologize for our rescheduling of the previous meeting and I apologize for any inconvenience this may have caused. It was a matter of um, it was not posted in all the right places for the right length of time and therefore it would have been illegal for us to have held that that night. So that's why it was rescheduled to tonight. Thanks. So um, we are going to go ahead and start off with any public members of the public who wish to come up and suggest or discuss anything with us in terms of zoning bylaw changes for this year. Come on up. Name and address, please. Hi, my name is Robert Falcioni. I am a long time uh, business owner of the in, in the downtown. I had a photography studio uh, uh, and a uh, news organization at 24 Main Street. And for uh, decades, uh, I have witnessed the changes in the downtown, uh, and I've seen uh, just uh, most of the time, most of those years, uh, it was very smooth sailing for uh, pedestrians, for traffic, not a lot of foot traffic. Now there's not a, a lot of foot traffic. You have a beautiful new library. Uh, Bill's Pizza is all redone. Have some businesses down by uh, the central house. and. Um, so I'm uh, sitting here to suggest that when the central house, uh, not to the uh, detriment, but to the, when the central house was um, uh, permitted, they were allowed to have one half of the parking that is allowed in other districts. Uh, other districts would have, with the formula that was used to determine their parking, would have had 72 spaces. Uh, and I was there at that meeting, uh, and they said, well, because of this bylaw we have for the downtown off-street parking, you only need 36. And so uh, I think that that's caused nothing but trouble. Uh, it's wonderful that the business is doing so well, but until these, uh, new, uh, this new municipal lot is built uh, and other lots might be built, um, there's going to continue to be uh, some sort of problem with the parking there. As we see uh, all over town, uh, the parking that has been permitted, for instance at Starbucks, where there is no drive-through allowed. However, uh, Madam Chair, it's very, sim it's very similar to a drive-through when you take into account the fact that they can order their food ahead of time on an app. And I don't think that's part of any of the uh, ZAC or planning board um, discussions uh, or, or considerations that, uh, that there's an app that, that customers can order ahead of time and not even be in the building. So uh, as a result, a lot of this has caused a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of different problems in different areas of town. Recently, the, um, uh, the drugstore was the first to put up a sign that said, you know, for a drugstore parking only. Uh, Bill's Pizza put up a sign similar and, um, and uh, then uh, One Lumber Street uh, put up a sign which specifically has the Starbucks logo and a cross out on it uh, and says just parking for this area. And now um, we see that Cross Point uh, that owns a lot where CVS and Marty's uh, are located has put signs up along their whole perimeter warning people that they will get towed and offering the number of the tow company uh, for when you want to retrieve your vehicle. So um, there's a major problem. I would ask that Zach consider rescinding that bylaw that allows the downtown off street to have 50% less than everywhere else in town. Thank, Thank you. you. I say Zach rescinding, I mean, if you would uh, consider uh, suggesting that to the plan. Address, address, please. 17 Maple Street. Um, are you going to cover um, housing as part of your overall? Is that what this evening's about? Me possibly? You're going to cover? Is that going to be one of those things you cover? Your bylaws regarding multifamily housing? Yes, that's certainly one of the zoning bylaws. Yeah. So we can certainly consider any suggestions you have. Okay, 
I was formerly an owner of apartment houses in town. I don't have any anymore. I don't intend to get any. But um, there's a little bit of looseness and ambiguity and unknown. I know at the town meeting, not this past year, but the year before the annual town meeting, they were going to have a, uh, a bylaw that, were, that you couldn't have an apartment building with no more than two family. Uh, so the present zoning, without any chaining, changes, I believe, I believe it could be either a two or three or a four. Uh, is that correct? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. And I'm sure you're going to visit that. And uh, also, the meters for the water and the sewer uh, become almost become quite a quite an issue. Is there, it would there be like one sewer charge for the whole house? Would there be uh, one water charge for the whole house, etc., etc.? Et I, I just I was just hoping that these might be some of the items that you would discuss. Okay. And um, do you do you feel that it should be separate meters for separate units in apartment buildings? I haven't really looked at the numbers, but I think I think it should be. I think. Uh, I think John will probably come up with a good, uh, if, if he's assigned the project, uh, he's the pro, and I have a lot of confidence in him. And I just think that's one of the things that we could look at. Okay. Um, and also, the, the setbacks as to whether or not they should be more stringent than they are for single family houses or whether it's a two or a three or a four. Right now, I believe the zoning, if it's a two family, you're allowed to make it either a three or a four, provided you um, meet with all the requirements mm -hmm. of the, of the, uh, the board, mm -hmm. the uh, housing, the uh, Chucky Cadillac, the building department. So I'm quite interested in how that turns out because I think one of the philosophical things we should be looking at as far as housing goes. I think we should be trying to develop the opportunity for everybody to stay here. If somebody wants to graduate from high school and go right to work, if he wants to stay in Hopkins, he should be able to have a place where he can go. If he wants to go out and go, get, go to school for a few years and come back, or go out into the world for 10 years and come back. But it's very hard for people at the entry level to find housing in this town. Yeah, uh, not just rental housing, even to purchase in the low, uh, the low, the lower zones. I know, uh, are you all familiar with the 40R? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the zoning, the 40R? Yeah. That is something that might be looked at. I think a lot of the towns today are progressively going, going after that situation and, and uh, basically allows you to have a $350,000 house that you could buy. It's, you know, three bedroom, you know, yep. formica here and there, carpets here and there, you know, but fine. And this is not only for the people that are in the younger age groups, we'll say up to 30, uh, either single or double or one, uh, single mother or single father, but then again, you also get into the, the group that's I know a, a few of my friends, a lot of people in this town lately have had to sell their house because of their age. They can't afford to stay here. They don't want to go into the housing. They have too much money to go into the housing. They would rather, and they just, there's just absolutely no, nothing for them to do. They're in a house that's probably worth 700,000. The taxes are killing them. They don't need the four bedrooms anymore. The kids are all spread across the United States. Uh, there's, there's nothing for them to stay in Hopkins. We're forcing them out of town. Yep. So somewhere along the line, either in, in uh, ownership or in rentals, uh, I was hoping that you might focus on um, being able to entertain their problem. Um, what else did I have for you? On a little bit of another subject, but still in housing, 
Uh, I think you need to tighten up some regulations and about in-law apartments and also an apartment that's connected to a house. A single family house wants to make an apartment next to it over the garage or something like that. What the regulations might be or uh, is it is allowable anywhere or everywhere or by special permit only or is it as by use? Uh, can you do it or can't you do it? I'm not here to say I'm for this or I'm for that, but I'm kind of interested in you, you as professionals covering these subjects because it's been a long time since any any planning board or ZAC board has has gone in and, and picked this subject apart and come back with a, uh, a conclusive study that really meant something and went and got it approved at the town meeting so that not so many of these things would have to go to the ZBA for uh, decisions all the time. It's expensive for somebody to do that, but time to advertise and you get an attorney and you get an engineer and whatever. Yeah. So a few years ago, we did take something to the town meeting um, regarding accessory apartments and um, with the goal of having fewer of them go to the ZBA. I what? think fewer, fewer of the homeowners needing to go to the ZBA for yes. approval. Yeah, that's the goal. That was the goal at the time. Um, we did not get it passed, but we have discussed some possible ways to to relook at that and this next year. Um, well, I think one of the reasons, Mary, that it didn't get passed was because it limited it to two to two to two units. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was too restrictive for the for the uh, the townspeople, I believe, at the time. Okay. Because a lot of people have the old houses along, you know, Grove Street or somewhere where they, they, they could easily convert it into two apartments on the first and one on the second, or even a, even a third up on the third, uh, third floor. They could put a third apartment up there very easily, a little studio. And I think it would be do, do two things. It would help the, the elderly and it would help the, the younger people. But another question I have on the uh, in-law apartments, which I know there are quite a few of them in town. I don't think there have been many houses that were built as in-laws from, from day one, but they were conversions. Mm -hmm. But some of them, there are some. There's one, I know there's one in Teresa Road that was built that way 40 years ago. Um, what happens when that person, uh, say it's uh, the mother-in-law or the grandma or somebody, decides to move into an assisted living place or, or, or passes or something happens like that. It's, it's not, there's nothing in the books that says that you can rent that out to somebody. And what, what does someone do with a thing like that? They've all of a sudden, grandma's coming back to town, we're gonna spend $40,000 or $50,000 in today's money to fix it up so that she can have a little place to park her car and, and, uh, and, and now all of a sudden, Four years later, she got old, or grandpa passed on or something, and it's, she, they wanted, for one reason or other, they need to make a change. It could be even a child. It could be even a, a single mother that wants to come back and, and live as an in, in an in-law apartment. They would hopefully qualify. But I think when they're converted from in-law and the in-law leaves, I don't think the burden should be remain with the homeowner, because he almost has to sell it unless he can rent it. He's not going to be able to rent it unless he has the, the proper um, double exits, separate uh, heating systems, separate uh, whatever. Maybe not have separate heating systems, but there would be a criteria. But that ought to be in black and white so that it, it would be an easy transition for when the person who passes on or leaves the in-law apartment um, goes, it could automatically become a an income earning property right on the same premises. Okay. I know there's gonna be some people that might object to that, but again, you're getting back to, what do we want to have for a town here? We don't want to be elitist. We want to be inclusive. And if we're gonna do that, and we really mean it, we're gonna to have to deal with the younger people, and we're gonna deal with the, the older people. Finances are, are very important too. I think we've got a lot going for us now. There's 
the new town planner is probably the best one we've had here since Charlie Zedek was a town planner before he, when he came from Worcester 80 years ago. And this guy is good, and he's got the background, and he's got the ambition, and before he goes on to bigger and better pastures, I think we should get him to work on something like this. Thank you. Yes. Does anyone else have clarification questions for Mr. Terry on some of his suggestions? So, that's about it. Yeah, well, one of the things I want, want to clarify is that you know, when, when uh, Mr. Terry was talking about uh, the 40R, which, which brings us to, which uh, it's, uh, the state has it at eight units, eight single family homes per acre, 12 um, condominium, uh, 12 townhouses or 20 uh, condominiums per acre. And that's, and, but 20% of them have to be affordable. Um, but and then other and then the, the the town automatically or city automatically gets a gets a kickback from the state of anywhere from ten thousand to six hundred thousand dollars plus three thousand for every for every unit that they that, that they um, put up in this in this district. Um, but then people say, well, what, you know, what we have in, in Hopkinton is more school children. We don't want more school children. Well, the state understands that. And then there's also a forty S that goes along with the forty R. And the 40s, um, they have an algorithm, and and the and the town actually gets um, uh, money from the state to um, educate the students that come from the from the 40r. So it ends up being a very good program for both the, for both having affordable housing, um, as well as um, uh, being able to educate the kids that come in. So it was, it was a great suggestion. Right. Some of the criteria that I mentioned is is movable. Uh, an acre doesn't have to have four, eight, eight No, they, you can have up two. Is yeah. That's yeah. But it would, it would, it, that isn't anything that I don't think we're interested in advocating here. But I think John knows more about uh, 40R than, than any of us. And if he were to present it something, if he were asked to present something to the board that would be informative and conclusive, I think I think the board and then eventually the town could could maybe maybe go that way if that was a way that, that the board felt probably would go through the planning board too. So, uh, but uh, if you're gonna, what John said needs uh, a lot more depth put to it, a lot more explanation because you know he he summarized it, which is dangerous. So if you're going to think about 40R, we'll you, look you, should, you should all learn what 40R is. It's otherwise, it, if, if I may, it's otherwise known as live, work, and play. They tend to try and have, have these near uh, transportation areas or, or downtowns so that people can take advantage of all the, uh, all the aspects. But rather than not to, say, not to say anything against you, John, but not, rather than have you tell the board what it's all about, oh. we have a professional, and he's a teacher, and he could tell the board right over there. He's got a good name, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It went to, it went to a great school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would any of you like to speak? Hello. My name is Srini. I'm from Legacy Farms North, 19 Juniper Trail is my address. 1919 Juniper Trail. J U N I P E R. I'm sorry, what was your last name? Vijay. B I J A Y. <coughs> Hope we all know what the agenda for North members have here. It's one and only concern and a appeal to all the members here about the school bus stop that we want to move up the Spruce Street uh, location. We all know what's going on with this uh, with the school bus issue here. It's 250 plus families that we are located there and phase two of our project is already complete which means that we are at full capacity and we have almost 180 students for as of October 2019 for boarding the bus from uh, Franklin 
uh, junction and also there is a new bus stop at Wilson and uh, 85 North intersection. The major concern that we have at this point is the growing number of students from just from our community has uh, an imminent uh, danger of getting into some sort of an unwanted situation on both bus stops because the bus is not coming close to our location. We have to drive almost 100, 150 cars that goes between 6 and 8 o'clock, which is also a very rush hour for the office traffic and not to mention though the road uh, from Frankland all the way to Wilson is still considered a private road. There is a good amount of public common traffic that uh, is using that road to bypass the uh, 135 North traffic or congestion, I would say. So given all these uh, considerations, you know, we would, we would request the committee to consider moving the bus stop uh, all the way up to Spruce Street or somewhat closer to Spruce Street so we have more safety for our kids. And at the same time, you know, all, we all have kids who, whom we brought up to a great age now. They wander all the time. It's not that they just get off the bus and they listen to us quietly. We wish that would happen, but it doesn't happen all the time. And most often we uh, carpool with two or three kids. So it's not just managing one kid of our own who normally don't listen to us always. It's a bunch of kids that we want to manage at that time. Uh, and we also found a few instances where though the school bus is uh, stopped there, the traffic doesn't recognize that it, it is a stop that they want to wait until the school bus leaves and people by mistake or unknowingly leave uh, the junction to move forward which is even more dangerous. Mm -hmm. And with kids running all around the place, it's hard to uh, keep control of anything, be the traffic, the kids, or our mindset to keep them and take them back home in a safer position. I'm, uh, I'm sure John knows more about this. We have been talking and meeting with John quite often, bringing up this topic. Uh, but from the zoning advisory committee, what we, uh, what we appeal here is consider this as a very serious safety concern and help us get this on to the special town meeting by any chance so we can get a public vote, we can show them we have some presentations and videos where we can show the real threat with all the heavy duty construction vehicles that keeps piling up on a daily basis to finish the other phase and how the threat is more serious compared to any other bus stop location for uh, Hopkinton school buses. So just for those members um, who aren't as aware of this issue, obviously, John and, and Carol and I uh, on planning board this past year, we've um, also you know, visited the, the uh, location as well. And um, th the problem with this is that um, the streets are normally not accepted as town streets until um, a, a subdivision is absolutely complete. Um, and this is a situation where we, we want to possibly have the special town meeting um, accept the street early with you know, contingencies and to make sure it's completed correctly when, when the, the subdivision is all, all construction is done. But it is a very severe um, safety issue uh, for the school kids. There's a lot of school children getting on buses and they're getting on buses. They have to get on the buses way at the end of, of the road. Um, they cannot walk there easily. Um, uh, at least a mile, so. at least a mile from Spruce Street or there are even houses beyond Spruce Street which takes another half a mile to get in yeah. to their houses. So, so, so the parents have been, you know, uh, doing the best they could, carpooling and getting people down to the bus stop, mm -hmm. but at the place where the bus stops are, there's no place for parking. <laughs> and so we've been looking at a lot of temporary possible solutions. You know, that was a you know, possible temporary solution down at um, 135 um, and a temporary parking lot. And that, again, was 
was only going to suffice for a short amount of time. But now that we may have the opportunity at special town meeting, um, I, you know, certainly, I personally support, you know, the acceptance of that road. And I think that we can properly put contingencies in place to make it work. And I'm hoping that um, all of you can individually support this as well. Well, what we have, if I, if I may, to the chair, what we have to be careful of is that that at, at Zach, we change bylaws. I don't yeah. know, you know, and to 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 go a, go completely against what the bylaw sends right now. I don't know if we can do that at town meeting. What we what we should really try and do is to modify the bylaw so that a road like a road such as that can be accepted. And that might be a better way to get it get it through town meeting. So we're not saying we, we're going to be going against DPW. We're going against everything, but to modify the bylaws so, so a road such as that can be accepted. I'd like to discuss that more. Obviously, mm -hmm. not tonight. Um, but but um, I wouldn't. You know, perhaps it is a change to the bylaw to allow exceptions to mm -hmm. the rule because I don't think that we want to accept all roads before they're finished normally. This is this is a, a very much an exception to the rule. State money was used to, to build it, that's why. So it's yeah. almost really a right. public road already. Yeah, to exactly. Yeah. So this is, this is a special situation, which may or may not be appropriate to change the bylaw when it's a very special situation. But we, mm -hmm. can, we can discuss that, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, so, so either way, I mean, I don't think as a committee we can go up there and support the change. I agree, but individually we can consider that, um, and and we will discuss whether or not a bylaw change is appropriate as well. So, sure. so can I ask you a question? Is there sure. a timeline for the construction completion? Uh, very good question. The current timeline is 2022 for phase three to complete, okay. uh, but that does not necessarily mean it is just with. Uh, Pulte group that they are building the phase three to complete, but there is also the other uh, affordable uh, housing that goes beyond legacy forms, uh, beyond the Pulte construction, which is called the trails in Hopkinton. <coughs> and that, uh, I'm not sure what is the timeline for that to complete. And just correct me here, uh, the road can be accepted as completely private, uh, sorry, public, only after the trails is also complete and all the houses within Pulte has been sold and handed over to a house owner. Mm -hmm. So that's no, no. I, I three years, four years. <laughs> no, thank you for making us this. This sure. issue has I've heard about this issue even last year came up in the planning board meetings and all that and school committee meetings and we were always told that it was a insurance problem that the bus yes, uh, yes. Uh, company doesn't have insurance to drive in these roads and we were stuck in like a cyclical thing. So I kept thinking. We, unfortunately, it, it looked like the only solution was to wait for construction to be completed. I'm just, that's why I'm trying to figure out, is there anything, maybe if we have a timeline, you can consider what are the other options and stuff. Sure, so we, even from our community, we tried to reach out to multiple different bus companies, private transportations. They are, they are fine transporting anyone, but not when it comes to kids. There is always the straight answer, no, that we get from with additional insurance that Mr. Roy wanted to uh, shell some money out of his pocket for insurance. It never gone past the bus companies. It's, so it's carpool is the best option that we have right now, but again, uh, unless the road has been termed public, the solution is not going to fix mm -hmm. uh, the problem that we have right now. So, so God forbid, but this almost seems to be a accident waiting to happen, oh, yeah. given that more and more kids are going to uh, use that bus stop. Um, outside of this committee, I mean, has there been any, and I'm asking, you know, the more senior members of this committee as to, has there been any conversation about temporary measures? I understand what the bylaws say about this not being completely accepted till construction is over, but given this is a serious public safety issue involving children, mm -hmm. I mean, well, that's why that's why we you know we had several meetings with the uh, with the developer and Pulte and uh, as 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 well as other committees at the, at the, the the school committee and the superintendent and and we did come up with a a, a, a parking lot at the end near the near the old White House and um, uh, they worked it out so that the buses would stop there but that but many people thought that that was uh, didn't feel as though it was a good enough solution. So now we're back to trying to do what we can to um, uh, accelerate the acceptance. Okay. Okay. 
and so um, that's where we're at right now. But several other um, temporary solutions were discussed and rejected for various reasons okay. as right. well. Okay. Um, and, and that then, was the best one. <laughs> but the, but yeah, and, and to his point, you know, one of the one of the first ones we looked at was trying to get another another bus company. Yeah. But yeah. but um, for some reason, no other bus companies will come into another bus company's territory. And um, the developer did find a bus company that would um, send a, send buses over, but they would always send luxury buses. With the you know the kneel down with the with the air conditioning and televisions inside, and that would have been uh, three hundred thousand dollars a year per bus, and currently the, uh, we pay about fifty thousand dollars a year per bus to uh, through the uh, school. So that was it was cost prohibitive at the time. The, the only question that we have is the road is considered as a public private road. I'm not sure what is the term mean a public private road. Is it not a completely private road where we can say that between this and this time, the school boarding time, no public uh, public transportation can be made? Just throwing out some possibilities if something of that sort can be considered for a specific timeline. So, uh, you know, that can be one of the options that we were thinking. But again, the ultimate solution here would be accepting the road as public uh, with any contingencies that would that would be seemed appropriate, um, if not any other better solution. John, can you yeah. speak to the... So there's a few things that I, I would like to bring up through the chair. Um, it's a private road. It's not a public private road. That I don't think that's a thing. It's just, it's privately owned. It's, um, that's the reason the buses can't go on it. Um, so it's got, it's got its own set of issues uh, because of that. Um, in terms of having this road accepted at the special town meeting, it's looking more and more like that's not gonna happen. I've been talking to town council, trying to get this all set up, and the timeline to get a road accepted has a lot of requirements. Notification of the owner, uh, having the select board meeting, then refer referring it to the planning board. Um, it looks like if it can work, you're having like one day of play in between to get all the requirements done. And that's not including a review by the town's engineer to see what still needs to be completed. We have a review from 2016 uh, that basically lays out how much bond money was supposed to be paid. Nothing's been updated since then because it's a private road with construction going on it. So you, the town would be taking a risk by accepting the road without having that review done. Um, and talking with town council, I don't even know if that timeline's gonna work just based on the required notifications, uh, waiting periods in between hearings and stuff like that um, because it's been such a short timeline to get this and quick notice to get this special town meeting set up. Um, so it may be more appropriate to get it for the annual town meeting, but the special town meeting might be a real reach. Pardon my ignorance here, but we have been discussing about this issue for almost three years. Uh, I understand that, but the town meeting was just called for a completely separate issue. So nothing was prepared for this town meeting because no one knew it was going to happen. Okay. So once we found out it was going to happen, we, I had been researching it. It's still technically a possibility. I need to talk to town council and get a hard answer from them. Um, but just with the timeline that was laid out, it's a real struggle to get everything that's needed to, get, to follow the town's bylaws to get a road accepted. It's a real struggle to get all that. What would be the timeline that we are looking at? Uh, That's what I need to clear up with the town council because it looks like if the planning board has a meeting to refer, so first of all, the planning board needs to get 100 signatures. I don't think that's gonna be an issue. But to get those 100 signatures, the planning board then has to introduce that to the select board. The select board may need to refer it back to the planning board or if the planning board brings it before the select board, that's the confusion I'm having with town council. I haven't gotten an answer about that. If the select board, needs to meet on it and refer it back to the planning board, that's an issue in of itself because you need to get the 100 signatures, the select board would have to hold a hearing and then refer it back to the planning board, which have to hold a hearing. Both of those have to be noticed for 48 hours beforehand. And then you would need to get the uh, warrant article into the town clerk by the 21st to get signed off on the 22nd because that's the hard deadline for the 9th. Mm -hmm. If the planning board has a meeting on the 13th, and they say they have the 100 signatures at that point on the 13th, they need to then refer it to the select board. The select board needs to notify the owner seven days prior to a hearing. So if the select board has a meeting on the 18th, 
um, or sorry, it's the 19th, I think is the regular scheduled select board meeting. They may need to notify next Tuesday in order to meet that timeline. So there's also confusion as if the planning board gets, has to send this to the select board, um, does the select, can the select board schedule a meeting without even having a proposal from the planning board at that point? And I've heard, no, they can't. So basically you have to wait until the 13th when the planning board can vote to send that to the select board. And then you're already past the seven day timeline to notify the owner. So then you can't add it to the agenda or to the uh, warrant article on the 21st. So these are all the things that I'm trying to clear up with town council and I haven't gotten an answer yet. Um, but it's just looking like the required notifications to the owner um, for the meetings and all that kind of stuff is a really, really tight window. Um, so basically the planning board, another thing to add is the planning board would meet on the 13th, but it would be the night of the 13th. You can't file anything until the 14th. So then if the 14th happens and say the select board met on the 21st to approve it, the notification would have to be to the owner on the 14th. So it's like, depending on what happens, it's, so it's, it's a, a real deadlock struggle. that I'm assuming that it's a deadlock on all, all possible angles that just cannot move and, forward. Uh, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say it's a deadlock. It's just with the short timeline and the availability of members for the planning board and the select board and when they can meet and try and get all this in time. And with the set requirements for notification in the bylaws, it just, it might not really work because it's only a four week notification from when the, the select board and voted it to allow the special next town, town regular town meeting. Probably. In May, May 4th. Yeah. By that time we would have crossed the winter where it is even more dangerous for our kids to use that bus stop with snow right. piling all around the pavement where we usually have to park the car. We will have to park on the street where the regular public traffic will still be using that. Now, when we say it is a private road, um, what, what, what would it take us to have the road not being used by regular public for a certain period of time? Is that something the town can help us, Zach or any other committee, where we can approach to say that the public traffic cannot be happening between this time and this time to enforce that? Uh, I don't know how, what's involved in shutting I mean, the road. It's a, it's a private road, so it would be up to Roy McDowell, okay. I would believe, to handle that any kind of traffic on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, maybe the police could be at the intersection with the public road. I, I don't know. So we have tried that option. I mean, John has spoken to the chief and they came there at least a couple of times to witness what is going on, how much mm -hmm. traffic is there. And they do agree that there is a big safety concern uh, given the road is being used by regular public plus school timing traffic and uh, office peak hour traffic, etc. But uh, he's been helpful uh, to begin with, but at the same time it is not a daily scenario where we have a cop waiting there monitoring the traffic which might not be feasible uh, from their point of view as well but anything that can make it uh, safer much more safer for the kids will be really appreciated so if i may through the mm -hmm. chair um, yes. the planning board is having me having a meeting on the 13th whether or not they can get this road on this on the special town meeting and they are going to discuss the bus stop issue so i'd encourage all of you guys to um, attend and, and discuss sure. I've invited uh, town manager, assistant town manager, select chair, select board chair, fire, police, okay. uh, school committee, superintendent. So hopefully all of them will be all there. You can get everybody in the same room and discuss it. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very okay. much. Chief, do you have any suggestions? Um, for the no. Uh, no. I think I'm going to just follow your agenda if you need me to comment at all. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's no fine. driveway stuff or any of that stuff. You, you had some good ones a few years ago. Yeah. Okay. Or so, stuff. in addition, we received some um, several um, suggestions by email or memo. Um, so, these. <laughs> so I'm going to read them or summarize them. 
Um, this suggestion is from um, Tom Garabadian from 5 Davenport Lane. So, as a spokesperson for a group of condominiums located within the town of Hopkinton with more than 210 homeowners, I'm asking Zach to consider advancing a change in the zoning bylaws as they relate to Article 8, Garden Apartments, and Article 8A, Village Housing and Residential Districts. Specifically, we're requesting that the zoning changes passed by town meeting in May 2016 um, for rubbish disposal be reversed. As a matter of equity, homeowners who live and own units within these developments should be entitled to rubbish disposal services within the property taxes which we pay. There are at least 30 other communities within the Commonwealth, according to the Boston Globe, where all homeowners are treated equivalently with respect to rubbish disposal and recycling services. The requested change would cause rubbish disposal services to be provided by the town. Respectfully submitted. Okay, this is uh, and he and he is re representing Davenport Village, the Preserve, Indian Brook, and Stagecoach condominiums um, members of the, those communities. Um, so we will definitely add it to the list and discuss it again. It has been discussed in this past year, um, and we will probably have to look into any. Um, uh, agreements with the condominium developers at the times that they were developed to see what you know and the special permits that and the special approved. permits that were issued at that time um, because I I do not know I honestly do not know but um, if they were developed with specific um, agreements that the trash services were provided through a, a homeowners association um, and it wasn't just a, a matter of this bylaw, then it has to be considered in that way. Um, that means that certain um, uh, concessions were given to the developers so that they didn't have to do as much to prepare the property for trash pickup and so on. Um, and, um, and then therefore, the property taxes are actually not you know, covering that concession aspect. So that's what we need to investigate in order to make that a reality. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes. So is the implication of uh, uh, Mr. Thomas's letter that until May 2016, when uh, the town meeting reversed the changes, um, rubbish pickup was do being done by the town? That's what it seems to imply. Mm -hmm. But that is not what I know to be true. Um, one way or the other. I'm really not sure okay. until we do the research. It could be true for you know some of the condominiums <coughs> and not others. I'm I'm just not sure okay. what the situation okay. is. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, some of the other ones received by email. Okay. This has to do with the downtown corridor construction um, suggestion by Amy Ritterbush to relax some zoning restrictions temporarily during downtown quarter construction, um, specifically uh, <coughs> off-premises signs and temporary signs. Um, so off-premises signs are not allowed now, but during construction businesses may need to place a few signs, a few buildings away to alert people how to find them. Um, a, you know, our limit on number of temporary signs could be relaxed because businesses need to post directional signs to alternate parking or alternate entrances. And, um, and she, she said, these are just some of the ideas I'd encourage Zach to talk to land use staff, um, Mass DOT, business owners on Main Street, et cetera, and there may be better ideas. Um, and I also suggest that we consult with, um, with the select board and town manager and so on and see what is being done in those situations, um, you know, and, and just make sure we're all working in concert. <laughs> so, okay. Change to pre-existing structure or designating minor changes. This is uh, suggested by Mike, Mike Shepard and supported by um, uh, Mark Hyman, the chair of the Zoning um, Board of Appeals. So, um, Mike had described where um, um, homeowner of a pre-existing non-conforming structure applying for a building permit to expand the structure generally has to go to the ZBA um, to because um, you know perhaps the the expansion 
falls within um, a setback um, from the road or from, from side or rear. And um, he's suggesting that we consider a change to the zoning bylaws that allows the zoning enforcement officer some leeway in determining whether or not the change is minor and uh, suggested uh, you know minor change would be dormers um, which is not expanding the footprint of a building but um, but would be within um, a pre-existing structure in that setback problem you know so um, so I think that that's it's perfectly reasonable. He says a lot of other jurisdictions do allow for um, the zoning uh, enforcement officer to have um, that uh, that leeway to determine whether the proposed change is minor or whether it needs to go to the ZBA. So, so that's a good one to discuss. And Airbnb, it comes up again. <laughs> um, also suggested by Mike Shepard, um, Mark. Hyman also supported looking into this, and he's uh, sent us some uh, some uh, references, um, email. Uh, I mean, internet references. So, Mike says he had an inquiry about the legality of an Airbnb on Maspinock. On the one hand, I can find nothing in our zoning that specifically allows it. That's true. It is my understanding that these things are not owner occupied, and the duration of stay is relatively short. Um, he references the B&Bs that are allowed in the zoning. Um, I've always assumed zoning did not deal with forms of ownership. For example, as a homeowner, I could rent my house for a week, a month, or even one day. But B&B naysayers are concerned about properties not being properly maintained, the turnover of occupants, um, and concern about safety for, from unknown short-term renters. And so he just suggests that we take a look at that. And, um, and if, if, we, uh, if, we, if we leave it without any, um, anything in the zoning bylaws that we might be opening the town up for some fees from town council if somebody tries to, um, to appeal to the zoning board to be able to do it in a B and B, an Airbnb. So reasonable, good. I think there were some other ones, John, that yep. should be added to our list. Um, so there's three more. <clears throat> I, I got a uh, email exchange with um, uh, Barry Rosenblum um, today about residential solar uh, and there was one example that he had a, a concern about but it's we found out it was a commercial solar development but he brought that up about residential solar and asking if um, there could be some more specific buffers for visual effects uh, when it's developed near residential uses um, right now it's kind of subjective mm -hmm. uh, but he was wondering if there was any way that it could be modified to address uh, any kind of visual effects of, of those kind of uses. Okay. Um, nothing too specific in, in the bylaw, but he was just asking it as a general question. Um, the other one is uh, looking into form-based code and if that would be something that would be worthwhile in Hopkinton. So form-based code is a type of zoning mm -hmm. where you don't necessarily regulate you, the use, you regulate the form of the building. Um, it's usually used in downtowns or in other kind of uh, high development nodes. Um, and it's just kind of a something that's been moving across the country and something that might want to uh, take a look at as part of Zach. Uh, and then the final thing is expiration of permits. So Kobe, Wallace, and I, this today, we're just talking about how certain permits don't have expiration dates listed in the um, the bylaws and we were wondering if that would be something that should be addressed given that we have a, uh, a subdivision coming in it didn't have to get a stormwater management permit but it brought up the issue of if a, a development gets issued a stormwater management permit and then 15 years later they want to go and actually develop it are they beholden to the previous stormwater regulations or the current stormwater regulations um, and by putting an expiration date on that it might ease some of those concerns by making them get a new permit more uh, 
in line with the current regulations. And Scenic Road is another one, earth removal, those type of things. They don't have expiration dates. Uh, special permits are state mandated to have an expiration date, so they, they do, but other local permits, it might be worth taking a look at and seeing if that would be something that the town would want to uh, take under. Thank you. That was it from, from the emails? That was, uh, yeah, those, so those weren't emails. Two of those were me. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> one of them, I guess, was an email, but yes, that's it. And through the chair, I, I heard one more that the, when we talk about um, uh, commercial uh, solar, we don't make a distinction between ground-based and roof-based. Mm -hmm. And we should probably take a look at that because, you know, some of the, like when we, when we put them on, on top of the schools and some other things, um, we, we may be touching off uh, some of the same screening requirements that um, really aren't uh, applicable. Got it. In certain towns, when we have been looking at the solar, certain towns have, have um, that we've used for comparison purposes or to get ideas, um, I have restricted ground completely and, and encourage a lot of roof-based ones, you know, so um, that is, that's also appropriate to look at. Good. Okay, I, um, oops, minutes. I cannot find the agenda. <laughs> um, I know that, um, I'm sorry, there, you came in a little later. Did you have any suggestions for us, or were you just, okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so, several of us went to various trainings or demonstrations and so on recently, and I was hoping that, um, Ron, you could go through. Could, could I just uh, give a presentation on some chamber recommendations? Absolutely. Before we get into I'm that. I'm sorry. So some of these. Forgot to ask the ZAC members for that. <laughs> Ron Foisey, 25 Chamberlain <laughs> Street, and the uh, Chamber Liaison to Zoning Advisory. So uh, the first one is a reprise of last year where we're recommending an increase in retail from uh, the current 2,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet. One of the discussions that we had last year was, you know, why, why 5,000, why 2,000, why 10,000? There is, there's no compelling reason, but we're not getting any interest or any traction mm -hmm. at the current 2000. And there's just a, there, there's a feeling among the developers that a, a larger retail square footage may attract developers to want to come into the area. So that would be for industrial A and B. 2000 to 10,000, you said? From 2000 to 10,000, 10, it's currently. That would be by right? That right. is currently by right. Mm -hmm. The second one would be a recommendation to remove the car wash by right in the downtown business zone. Yeah, that's, that's already on our work plan, absolutely. Okay, um, the, the, the next one would be to add a car wash by right to industrial A and B and the um, 169 West Main Street, which is the business zone where uh, Dr. Mena's office is around the corner from the price chopper. The, the fourth one would be, this is uh, not a specific recommendation, but uh, to review parking space requirements for certain types of uses in industrial A and B. Um, a lot of the, the current parking um, requires a lot of spaces that, that the current uses aren't. <coughs> Office space it has, is a tremendous glut in the Metro West area. So the, the, the types of businesses that are coming in are like Lichen or, uh, I mean, and, and the number of people per square foot of, of space is significantly less. Yeah, for warehouses, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a very different thing. And, it, and so the, the idea is, we, we had to take a look at certain uses where we, we might create some relief in the parking requirements to, to better attract some of those people in there. And the, the last one is, um, I'm, I'm gonna pass out a, just give you a map, uh, an area, 
And this would be kind of like focus on 80 South Street, where the town hall was temporarily post flood. Right. And that's a, a building that, uh, according to the developers that we're in contact with, that building is completely obsolete. And Ron, used. do you want to hand some up there? Thanks. Uh, that building is obsolete and could lend itself to some kind of a, you know. Um, you said the building is obsolete, meaning. Yeah. It, it's, just, it's just not, it, it's not conducive to any of the current uses, so it, it, it's essentially a teardown. Okay. You're talking about the building that Town Hall was in for a yes. minute? Okay. Yeah. So um, develop some kind of a planning vision for the zone to be a, be a hub of, of multiple type things, um, you know, light industrial, biotech lab businesses, um, you know, a, try to attract more services to town like restaurants and other things that both residences and businesses are looking for in the area. You know, maybe a, a multi-use thing where you've got some residential built into that area. And again, none of these are specific recommendations but the idea is to, to take a look at that, that parcel and say, can we as a, as a zoo planning community come up with an area that would be more, more appealing to a broader use of people coming in than just a, another office building that is, is, is vacant? So a good opportunity zone like the, like the feds are doing for certain areas like they did in, in Worcester and some of the other major cities that they so encourage uh, unique development. Okay. So how those, how yeah. big is the property? Do you know? Oh, the, the, the property the, itself? Yes. Well, the, I mean, if you look at the map, it's, it's, a, it's much broader than just that building, but that's, that's a big part of it. I don't know what the acreage or square footage is of okay. that property. All right. Thanks. But it, it's one of those things that Dell has, you know, they, they've been sitting on it and will continue to sit on it because there's really no demand for that building. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And that, and if I may, through the chair, one of the other, one of the issues is that you know, if um, if Dell vacates any more of the buildings, that there's not much call for office space right now. And um, so, what else can those buildings be utilized for, um, other other than office, so that um, the town can still pull the um, the applicable taxes, so the or similar taxes, as opposed to a uh, having no. Um, uh, personal property tax. So I'm sorry, just a quick, quick question, Ron. The image there is, uh, is it like a commuter thing? Is that like a WRT stop or something? It, um, that's one of the things that would be has? Okay. as a potential. Yeah. That's 80 South Street? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And does anyone else have any suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> just, just going back to what John said about how to use these buildings if Dell indeed uh, is not, no longer using it. Uh, there has definitely been the whole WeWork concept where people who are working from home who actually want an office location to go to almost like an office center where um, a day long rental or a, I don't know, maybe in a few hours kind of rental where everything is self contained within that. You've got internet access, you've got uh, air conditioning, electricity, everything else. So and you have a small cubicle where instead of working from home, you actually go into a professional setup and use that space as your uh, you know, home, home work away from home, yeah. but instead of going to an office. So that definitely seems to be a trend catching up. Um, WeWork, of course, you know, was in the news for all the wrong reasons, right. but companies like Staples are doing this, um, creating very fancy places where you can have a small meeting hall uh, with WebEx services, uh, a nice foyer with um, a couch and we can meet someone. So I think there are possibilities uh, that can be looked into. There's also the biotech incubators, which would include lab space potentially. The, so. the, the, we're hoping that this is kind of a catalyst for thought that yeah. says let's think outside the box and try to come up with some, we don't need more office space. Right. Let's right. come up with right. something right. that will really attract people to come into the area. And residential uh, and stuff for residents too. You know, this isn't just for business. You know, what what are some amenities that we can put there for for, for the residents of Hopkinton? 
that uh, that might that might spur other companies for saying, well, they look at they did this, they did this, and it just grows by itself, almost like what Mr. Terry was talking about, live, work, and play. Right. You know, this could be a, a, a great area for what he was just talking about, where where we put some some dense housing, which which the workers are there, and then there's already the buildings are there, and then we built some, yeah, just and it grows and grows and grows. So this is this is a, a big picture, long term plan. This isn't necessarily something that that I would recommend putting on the agenda, getting ready for town meeting, <laughs> but post town meeting Understood. when we when we can take a step back and, and really you know. Yeah, dig into it. So I, I was wondering if there is a way to, to take, just checking on the conversation, like if there is a way to sell it to the new things that we have added on. It has, we've always allowed uh, office space by right. It's still unoccupied. Yes. So let's move on to the last two years. What have we allowed by right? Say an entertainment space or focusing on just the new feature, things that we have allowed, maybe pushing it towards that and making it more of, like attractive to that kind of business, say attract, um, for example, for the entertainment, if there is a way that we can make the parking requirements fit the entertainment need, maybe we attract a new entertainment space in there or stuff that way. Or maybe we, maybe we invite uh, some other towns that, that were successful at doing this and having some of their planners or, or, some of, or, or maybe their, their Zach or their planning board chair or something to come in and say, how did you do it? Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe that can help us get something mm -hmm. done. Excellent. Good, thank you. All right, so can you go through sure. yeah. your um, yeah your recent training session? So uh, John had sent out a, a, a list of a bunch of trainings for planning and zoning. And I attended the Adopting and Revising Rules and Regulations workshop um, that was put on by Larry Smith, who is, has spent uh, decades and decades as a principal planner in a number of towns. And it really had to do with um, the, the fact that uh, planning boards uh, are always looking to adopt rules and regulations, governing processes, procedures, and all of these things. And the, the workshop was a lot about what's allowed and what isn't allowed. What are the pros and cons of rules and regulations versus bylaws? And a lot of those things, there was a, a, quite a bit of time was spent on charging fees to um, cover the cost of the outside consultant to review those things as mm -hmm. developers come into town. Um, he also spent quite a bit of time talking about the new subdivision rules. So subdivision rules are very specific and they have to be extremely comprehensive because if you are developing a subdivision, whatever is in the subdivision uh, bylaws, that's what, it, what carries. So it, his recommendation was uh, take a look at the subdivision rules to see if they're up to date with the, with the most current one. And an area that I found particularly exciting was uh, talking about how the, uh, the town planner in, in a lot of the towns out in the, this was out in Springfield, so this is Pioneer, Pioneer Valley yeah. Planning yes. Council. Um, but they were talking about having a two meeting maximum to get something through the planning process. And the only way that that was accomplished was have developers come and meet with the planner and all of the relevant boards and things all in one place to discuss their project at the beginning, let them hear from all the different, you know, conservation and, and uh, all the different boards that are gonna weigh in on this, have them have a conversation about it, send that person away with a kind of marching orders that this is what we're gonna be looking for and when they come and make that first presentation to the planning board, it's, it's pretty close to a, a, a completed project so that the timeline gets compressed tremendously and we could become known as a very planning friendly town as opposed to a, oh my gosh, we've got to go run through that gauntlet uh, in Hopkinton. So uh, some, some really good ideas and uh, you know there were like 20 different um, subjects and you know this is my second term on on Zach 
prior to that, I had no idea anything to do with zoning, and it was very, very enlightening for me. And you know, some of you have been our, our veterans <laughs> this thing and know and know a lot of it, but some some really good stuff. So, um, sorry, I had to leave the room for a minute. What what drives that initial meeting? Because I think that's I think that's a great thing where everybody's looking at the same thing and everybody's putting you know, there are concerns on the table before you even start the process, because yes. I think a lot of ours is you go to planning and planning says, I want this, and then they go to CONCOM and, and they're contrary because right. they want this. What, what drives that initial well, meeting? It, is, is, it, is it just it, an informal It, it is thing? an informal thing, but it would be driven by our planner. Our you know, John would be the one that would, would drive that. And gets, just gets all the bodies in, in one room to have an informal... Informal. Uh, just conversation. I'm, I've got an idea that I want to develop a blah blah blah. You say great, come on in. You get, you get all those boards together, and the developer makes an a, a informal presentation. Because they do that now to some extent in front of the planning board, but only the planning board. They'll come it's, in with, right. this is what I have in mind. What do you think of my? It's, it's that same thing, idea. but, a, but a, a much more comprehensive approach that will shorten the, the cycle of, of review. So if I may, through the chair, um, I would take a look, and I, I apologize, I can't remember, it was probably a year ago now, um, Gardner, Massachusetts, has mm -hmm. a uh, regulation in place that you need to have these pre-meetings prior to filing, um, and I think it may be for marijuana, but I'm not sure if it's for everything, okay. but it's a good, um, I think it's a good example to look at to see how you can actually put it in your bylaws to say you need to have an initial meeting, um, and then once you get that sign off from the, I think it's planning director there, you can then apply. Um, because if it's just an informal request, they don't do it. I mean, I've told every applicant that they can come in and talk to me and very few do. Um, no, I think, I think it's great because I think there's a lot of back and forth and there's a lot of time in, in hearings where you sit through and you get this far and then you've got to put this on the back burner and you go over here and it's very, it's a very, convoluted process not like i guess convoluted is not quite the right well, word well we also lose disjointed time process calling what we were talking about two months ago yes so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that so i think that i think that would be very very worthwhile to look at and consider mm -hmm. do you know john um how they do that do they have a once a month joint meeting to to look at these um, things or they usually it's usually on demand so um and i'm I'll have to look into it a little bit more, but you basically file a form that says, this is what I want to do for this okay. development. And then that form triggers a meeting, whether it's with just department heads or with it, whether it's with department heads and board members, um, you go through the process to figure all some stuff out. Once they sign off on that, you can then move to the next phase of the application, which is more final, uh, and then that gets presented to the board. So it's kind of, it's But good. it would be more with the, the working people in the departments yeah, as opposed to boards. Exactly. So it's good on both sides, I think. And I can talk to the planner over there to see how it actually has worked in practice. Mm -hmm. But you, you basically start the process before you've got all your plans done. Because okay. you say, I have this concept. It's fleshed out for the most part. But there's still some wiggle room that we have. So whatever you guys need me to do, we can change at this point rather than a lot of the developers will come in with essentially fully formed plans and say, this is what we're proposing. We can change some things, but, and that's kind of what it, the problem is. They, they've got a fully formed plan you say, oh no, I want you to go and change that. So now they have to go back to their engineers, yeah. redesign, all that kind of stuff. So it, it, it's worth looking at and talking to them and seeing if it's something that has worked for that city. Oh, I think so absolutely. I think that would be. And that was, the, you know, the title of this thing is Adopting and Revising Rules and Regulations. And this would fall mm -hmm. into that, similar to saying when you're bringing your plans in, they have to be to this size, this scale. I mean, there are a lot of regulations that we can put in place and just say, this is how we do things here. Mm -hmm. Those are in place in the subdivision regulations already. Right. Plan no, size and, all, and items that are required. Right, but I'm, I'm saying this this review process could become a regulation that just becomes this is this is how it's done here. Mm -hmm. So I forwarded the PowerPoint from Ron to all of you, yep. so you can mm -hmm. um, light reading. Um, <laughs> through the chair. One more related thing. I did find out recently that for board members in town, the fees are covered by the town. So you can submit your expenses and you will wow. get reimbursed for those. And uh, CPTC is, is kind of 
the main training that the board members go through. So if you are interested in CPTC, C, CPTC <laughs> um, let me know and we can work something out. But again, I'll, I'll throw a advertisement in. The uh, spring conference is really great because there's it's one day, a lot of sessions. It's in Worcester, so it's not super far. And there's a ton of other board members, uh, planning people there. Um, it's very busy, very exciting, and I would suggest everyone goes. Do you have the date on that yet? It's usually around St. Patrick's Day. I don't know. Is it's that the Holy Cross one? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one. And what does CPTC stand for? Citizen Planner Training... Okay. Cooperative? Co or yeah, something? I forget yeah. what the, oh. the second C stands okay. for. So I've, I've signed up for one, I think it's the first week of December. Um, so, um, and I sent that out a little while ago, so just if anybody wanted to join me, but there's other good ones you should definitely look at. Um, okay, next topic is the fire sprinklers. So, Carol and John, John and I <laughs> uh, recently attended a demonstration that the chief put on um, for the home fire sprinklers. And this was, was just fascinating, very interesting material. I sent you the website information and some, some, you know, some things I chose off of there that were most relevant to us. Um, the, the materials are very good. They're very self-explanatory. Yep. It helps a lot. Um, but I just wanted to say that, um, that potentially the opportunity for us in terms of zoning, um, from my understanding, um, the state does not allow us to require um, home fire sprinklers um, for new, new developments. So, but we can encourage it. <laughs> and some things that, I mean, I think Elaine, Elaine was at the demonstration as well, and she and I were talking about that, just, uh, you know, kind of chatting. And, and she was saying, um, in some of the rules and regulations in subdivision and so on, we can say, um, please present your plans for use of home fire sprinklers or the reason you're not going to do it, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. It's like just just using that kind of wording to make people think about it. And um, there's, there's really good examples from even just very recent, obviously Legacy Farms, um, did, I don't know if it's in every unit, but, it's, but they, they, did, they did do that. Um, it enabled them to do higher density and, and allow, um, allow more green space um, so, so, um, and then a recent um, Whisper Way, um, we were negotiating with that developer and it had to do with um, very long driveways and sometimes shared driveways and um, long cul-de-sac and which all were needed because of um, wetlands and not wanting to you know put a loop road in and encroach on wetlands as much um so so it was all a lot of give and take between the the wetlands the you know and the but the safety issue is is really important um also and and you know it really has to do with um how quickly and how quickly the, the fire department can get there in an emergency but also um, the type of equipment that can get down narrow roads and so on. And, and we're in a situation where most of the more easily accessible land has been built. So the developments we're dealing with now are going to be down more winding roads and harder to access and so on. So um, did you guys have anything to add? Love it. <laughs> and you are? <laughs> I think that was a wonderful description. Again, uh, some of this we're trying to uh, explore what our options are for the town, uh, just in safety or community risk reduction. Um, so the way you put it was wonderful. I think the, the idea is the number one option is in planning that we can offer incentives um, to deal with some issues like if there's, uh, uh, like you talked about wetlands or terrain, um, it may be something like uh, many of the towns use it for distance from uh, municipal water systems as a factor. Um, 
the one thing that we found just in that meeting is towns like uh, Stowe and Medway and Holst and just some of our neighbors are doing the same type of thing, seeing how we can uh, work with a developer and um, deal with some of these unique, unique issues and have something that we can uh, offer as an incentive uh, that improves in safety. So uh, even in our driveway access that we talked about, um, I'm able to do this with commercial properties under the CMRs in the state and we can assess something. We did it with the uh, Marathon School with some of the emergency access. There was some terrain issues and I said, you know, they did some nice things for us to be able to position fire apparatus that were above and beyond the code. So I said, you know, a couple of feet off of the road, if it makes it better for you, then it's what you've done for us is good and that's, that's the kind of relationship we want to establish and it's worked well. For private residents, it's a little more challenging. You know, they're, the, they're trying to encourage building, um, but we don't want to lose sight of the safety issues. Um, you know, if we get to the point where it gets too far and we haven't dealt with an issue, I think this is the opportunity, so I wanted to talk to you the way you presented it. I think another example, if I could just bring it up, that in this exploration was um, I attended the um, Zoning Board of Appeals, looked at some properties uh, around the lake that they wanted to, um, they were basically small uh, camps that they wanted to make into larger houses. So they needed special permits. And I was able to talk to them a lot about the risk that comes with making bigger houses that are close and that have some limited access. Um, I think everybody was kind of realizing the risk I talked about was there, but because the building code um, doesn't cover this special exemption area of it, so that now as a town we're just saying yes or no to some type of this special permitting. I didn't feel like we were able to address the issue very well, and as much as everybody has good intentions, um, adding a home sprinkler system to a, a property isn't like something that everybody naturally says, oh, I want to do it. So. Uh, um, it, it, we got to kind of try to figure a way to build it into some of these. Uh, not every house is going to end up sprinklered, and that's not our goal right now. Um, but what we're talking about is, I'm thinking of these examples of how can we get it so when we need a special permit and, and uh, for somebody to, to be able to say yes and not ignore a safety issue while we're saying yes. It's, um, so those are the kind of two scenarios that I've been dealing with, and uh, I want to solve it so that we could go to a town meeting or or have a planning board feel really comfortable that we can build a consistent offering to a group um, so that it is consistent and nobody feels like there's some special deal or favoritism so right. i, I kind of just uh in a homegrown effort here i wanted to to show you what it was about and i think we had a good demonstration of what that was uh, it was nice to see some other communities get involved and I hope we can kind of build, uh, whether it's a bylaw or some type of uh, process that, that is acceptable to, acceptable to the community. That's what I'm thinking about. Right. And I remember the insurance issue that you, you brought up to me and we talked about um, uh, that, and particularly in situations where, you know, long driveways, et cetera, um, that people have often, you know, when they're buying a new house, they don't think about sprinklers, they don't think about the insurance rates, they think, oh yeah, it's just, well, it's just insurance, you just, you know, get home insurance. But it was astronomically expensive because of some of the safety issues, and with home sprinklers, it can drive down the insurance rates considerably. So it is something that I think should be a part of a package of, of things that we talk to people about. And developers may not be as much you know encouraged by that aspect of it but but you know the more consumers become aware of it the more developers will pay attention to it as well so yeah i think we were able to um it was wonderful at, at whisper way uh to be able to get uh ron nation to to talk with us and uh you know take that leap was a great um, example of, I think we're making progress. And, he said and, that too. Yeah, that he 20 years ago, that. it was just a, you just don't do that. Yeah. So we've kind of broken through that. We're recognizing the safety. The cost points have gone down. As you mentioned earlier, there's literally going to be a thousand units in legacy farms that are sprinkled units. Um, we already have a fire that was uh, contained with nobody home to the area of origin, and that's a success story. Um, it's, you know, those units are close, and with nobody home, if that fire was discovered by the time it's 
leaving a window like some of the other fires we had right when I started as chief. You know, there's when they're, the density is like that, now you're risking your neighbor's properties. And uh, so that was a wonderful application of it solved the problem. And uh, they were able to do the other things, like you said, open space and, um, you know, uh, denser and easier access or whatever comes on the board. So my, my little experts here, so I want to, uh, any other topic you think we want to just add in? Uh? No, I think you had an excellent segue in to just say we now have some more atypical situations of proposals of these developments. And as the chief mentioned, we have you know different different access issues or water issues. And as those who attended, um, just to understand today we're building different homes. We're putting different contents in our homes that are make, making fires burn faster, burn hotter, and to kind of address all these issues. Um, 40 years ago, we had 17 minutes to escape a home fire. Now we're down to two to three minutes. That time frame has really shrunk. So now, when we have these atypical situations where we're increasing our risk, I think it's great if we can consider something to bring that risk back down. And I think a lot of you saw the home fire sprinklers are definitely a, an option that we should all kind of have on the table, talk about. I think, like you mentioned, educating people about that. I think seeing it was believing it. Yeah. And um, that would be kind of what I'd just like to add to. So, Madam Chair, the documentation that you shared was very, very useful. Uh, a lot of that, I felt, was the incentives part of it for the right. builder. Uh, what was in it for them? It was very clear. Um, I think the officer just said, uh, nailed upon something, which is the public uh, awareness. So I, as a homeowner, need to know that this is important for me. But also, uh, what kind of cost am I looking at? Can I do this using existing plumbing? <coughs> Does it require new plumbing? I think there is an opportunity for us to maybe have a public campaign <coughs> Just to talk about the inherent risk sure. of, of not having that, right. uh, not scaring people, but educating them, right. um, and, and talking about uh, how it can be laid on, uh, overlaid on top of a pre-existing home, pre-existing plumbing, and giving them some idea of how to calculate costs. Uh, ultimately, I think it comes down to people worry more, more about their pocketbooks rather than, okay, a fire will unlikely event, I'll worry about that later. But if that can be uh, sort of classified as here is a cost point, a price point for that versus the price point for an insurance loss or sure. what you're going to lose, I think there is an opportunity for us to look into some kind of uh, public awareness um, campaign as, as a town. I think that's very reasonable and, and certainly, you know, you guys are, are, um, are leaders of that and I know that um, uh, at the um, Poly Arts and, and the Family Day. It was Day Family Day. Day. We did a public family demonstration, Day, we were right? Doing some some education programs and so on. Um, the website that I forwarded to you. Um, there's there's um, other materials that I didn't specifically pick out sure. um, that are more geared toward um, consumers. Okay. So um, if you you know on a personal level want to sure. look into that more, sure. you can certainly do so. Um, but they, you know, they have a lot of good information on there that's very usable um, and adaptable even to, to you know, uh, local needs. Okay. Um, we wanna, if we want to do anything like that. So. Sun brought up a good point: is um, to make this effective, it's building the new home is the time to make it happen. That's it's it's tough. So much it's, easier. Yeah, that's right. that's the time. So that's why, you know, I know we've done a lot of building in Hopkinton, but um, the opportunity is the lots that are going to be developed in the future are these more challenging lots and this is where this incentive incentive program is the most effective and where they're going to look to the fire chief just to say let the person build a house and i'm saying these are challenging they're going to be in areas that don't have municipal water that have lots of rocks and and ledges that and, and they're going to ask you know can you somehow get in the driveway and that, that that's what we're going to run into more and more and it puts us all in a tough spot so I'm trying to have something that gets us to yes, where we can have this incentive there. And um, the cost uh, points that they're talking about are so much better now than they were 15 years ago. And now, if you can, we haven't identified the insurance savings part. So that's our goal to try to okay. to see if we can better produce that as a number. Yeah, there, there. You know, the, we ought to be able to you know, like get some sample quotes. Of, yes. You know. Yeah. Yep from various insurance companies. So. 
But we'd like to know too, is, it, is there a way, um, it's not just gonna flow, even with some of the education, the interest level fades off. Yeah. There's gotta be a way we can give this a little bit of a bump uh, that, that we can get some more interest when somebody's building a home, uh, whether it's a bylaw or whatever allows us to do it. Again, I, I think it's the bylaw that deals with, it's not a typical situation. It's, it's a long way from public water. It's got some challenging access issues. They're, they're looking to do, create open space. So they're asking for density. That's, we got to figure out how to apply it there and try to put, build it into our system there if, right. if that's possible. Right, exactly. Okay. I like the question on the, the initial thing. What's your plan for it? And if you're not putting it in there, what's your reason? Because then at least it brings it into the conversation and it becomes a negotiation point. If, if they don't want to put it in and they want long driveways and they're in a bad terrain, then, then it yep. becomes something to, to discuss further and to you know reassess and go back to and bring back again. And I think a nudge at helps too, right? At yeah. least it's coming up at the front when it's not, you know, it's not an expensive add to a new construction home, but it is to an existing home. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So is that, if, the, if, if there is a bylaw that talks about the water usage for a new development, maybe adding language in there saying that if you have municipal water, consider a sprinkler system along with the, because any new developer will look at the water usage bylaw. Maybe the language can go, can it go there, do you think? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm well. not sure. Yep. I think that's something we'll just have to kind of explore and see where, like we said, we, we want to look at those challenging situations and where we have something that's increasing our risk. And if we have that, then that's when we start talking about, it. okay, there's an increased risk here. What are we going to do to bring it back down to a, a typical mm -hmm. proposal? Yeah, wasn't there something about the water usage actually from sprinklers is much less than the water usage from a fire hose to put out your fire. So yeah, yes, so that, that uh, causes much less damage if you use a sprinkler yeah, rather than true. a fire hose. <laughs> we, yeah. we use a yeah. lot of water. <laughs> well, okay. the force point. No, yeah. it was it was an amazing demonstration. It opened my eyes up. I, like I I literally went back and I was like, can we put sprinklers in our house? <laughs> and then I was like, oh, we have well water. But that, that's why I was like it. I would look at water options first, right. and that's where I was like, maybe it should say there, if you have many municipal, consider sprinklers. Like, yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't say that you were there. Too. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Just a suggested recommendation in yeah. the... Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, to, I'm just trying to figure out where the language can go in, today, and I right, can't figure today. out which right. section. Right. Yeah. And I'm not an expert at yeah. the Zach part, and that's why I'm hoping you can help and... Uh, we yeah. develop something that's acceptable to town meeting and everybody. I don't want to be up there just lecturing safety stuff. Right, so. I know. <laughs> but, I, all together. Yeah. but if we do take it to town meeting, I, I would... I would happily get up. Thank you. Happily well, get up. <laughs> yes. Correct me if I'm, I understood from the presentation that you couldn't legislate it. You couldn't put it in your bylaw as a requirement. So, so I think it's the universal, you know, you have to put a home fire sprinkler system in Every, every house. Home, every new so home. now I'm just trying to say, is there a way? It sounds like some communities, uh, there was some legislation that we saw out of uh, Berlin, Mass, and in these towns. Again, it may be me going to um, a planning board or the way we accept these developments that when these conditions exist, then this would take place. Uh, okay. You know, uh, th that's kind of the discovery part of this. Um, so we could ask town council. So at what level this if that's the right for the chair if i may just to clarify i think one of the ways that so and i'm probably going to be repeating because you described it very well but for in a, a development you can't make a condition that all units need to be sprinkler but you might be able to say for units requiring a waiver of the driveway length those will only get the waiver if they're sprinklered oh. that kind of a thing or if there's a special permit that they need to get for common driveways as a condition of that special permit then they okay. would need a sprinkler, whereas they don't need to get the special permit for common driveways if they design the, the development a different way. But if they need a, a permit for that development, just in general, then you probably couldn't require all the units to have it. So, so, you, if, so you could add it as a condition to your special permits? To, I, I would think to certain waivers or special permits, not to all, um, all special permits. Okay. 
I have learned from the planning board there's a lot of waivers that come through every project that I'm sitting there. So that's been my learning curve. So I'm hoping that oh, yeah. there's all the waivings going on, we can get a little of this going on there. So. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Good. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you for the time. And I appreciate you. you all attending, too. That was, that yeah. was uh, very nice for, oh, thank for you. us. Thank you. That was great. Thanks. Thank you. So Rhea also um, sent us some information, or I forwarded the information on a podcast, which is a very easy way of doing self-training. <laughs> so, um, and she found that this, this particular thing was interesting. Um, so I just encourage you to look into it. Thank you. Um, I believe, other than that, it's just minutes, right, John? Okay. So we have minutes from, is it October 10th or is it? Uh, September 30th and October 10th. Oh, okay. I thought we already approved the September 30th ones, but people have a chance to review the minutes. I did. Good. Yeah. Any changes to the September 30th minutes? No. No? No. Okay. Okay. Motion uh, to approve. Second. Thank you. All in favor of approving, uh, are we going to do both at once? Motions? No, you, you, you only asked September 30th. 30th. Just September 30th first. All in favor of approving? Aye. 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 Any opposed abstentions? Okay. Now the October 10th minutes. Any changes? No. Uh, it could just be a typo, but I think, John, your name is both in present and absent. Oh. On the list of people. Probably he was probably late. Yeah. He were late. <laughs> you were late that day. Yeah. So he was present. So I was both. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not, I now that it's, it's exactly correct. <laughs> I can't believe I made it on time here. I was at the, the weeds meeting before this was right. at DPW, and, and then I flew out of here and I said, "Oh my goodness!" Luckily, I borrowed my daughter's truck. I broke and, and, no, and, on the way here. No, her, her clock is five minutes fast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it tricked worked. you into it getting here. Me, I made it here. My I'm machine, done. not yes. a truck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so motion to. Motion to motion to accept. Thank you. <laughs> Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Right. Who, who seconded that one? You're gonna have to get real good at taking notes, aren't you, with Kobe not attending <laughs> planning well, board? Steph, Steph is gonna do that. Oh, so we have a new person. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed abstentions? Very good. Thank you very much for coming, Thank the, you. the audience. Thank you, Mr. Terry.